Welcome to Commander Central, episode 133, and this week we'll be looking at listener Jeff Say's Bant Super Friends deck, captained by Estrid the Masked. I'm Dana. And I'm Max. Max. We're in Vegas right now. We are in, well, yes, we're in Vegas right now. By the now. time it's... this is airing, we will be in Vegas um, doing GP things. Well, almost. We'll be getting ready to, yes, we will be doing GP things, just not at the GP. Exactly. We'll be uh, playing the... commander outside of the GP environs. By the time this airs, we'll be getting ready to go to the pool. Yeah, right. There we go. We'll be down the, getting a horrible sunburn in the sun. Yes. You and I managed to avoid that last last year in the uh, desert heat. We were okay. Number one, we are guys that spend a little bit of time, a little bit of time, not too much, but a little bit of time outdoors, so we're not, like, super pale-skinned. Right. Um, however, friend of the show and uh, fellow podcast professional Patrick Sapola, who uh, writes for EDH Rec and is on the Commander Time podcast, he was not so fortunate last year. No, he wasn't. Uh, anyone, oh, poor Patrick. <laughs> anyone who's seen Patrick in person, um, he's he's pale. I think would probably be the charitable way to phrase I, it. I, I believe he's related to Casper, the friendly ghost, in some way. He's translucent. I think that's yes. why we would say he's translucent. He he had a hole in his shirt, like in the shoulder, like just a small, like not like a like I'm cool and I'm wearing torn like a dime, right? Not not like he's like a like a punk rocker from the '80s. Just a small like wear spot in the shoulder of his was his shirt and he got burned through that hole in his shirt not like outside walking around and hiking crossing an alley in between buildings last year like in the sun for you know a minute or two and he got burned through a hole in his shirt so uh yeah patrick's just gonna need to uh cross over into the gp this year through the morlock tunnels underneath the west gate so, Godspeed, Patrick. Please don't burst into flames because I'm not carrying a fire extinguisher to Vegas just to keep you safe. Any uh, business or anything we want to get into here, Max, before we jump into this deck tech? Uh, you know, we have some contests going on right now on Patreon. If you support us, are able to support us, you might be able to get uh, one of these decks you play episodes for yourself. But you'll also get entered into win. The uh, altered Lord Windgrace Planeswalker card done by a local friend of the show, Ben Johnston. And we'll also ship a regular copy of the card with it so you know what it does, because I don't. Something <laughs> with lands, something with lands. All of a sudden, the game's over. Win target um, game, I think this is ultimate. Yes. Um, and on Twitter, we're giving away the uh, signed Great Defender card from Legend, signed by Mark Poole. We actually got a nice retweet on that, um, I think, by the time this airs, about two weeks ago from from our friend uh, DJ at Jumbo Commander. Um, for some reason, he's like, I want that card. <laughs> so well, we'll see if he wins the contest. D- DJ, I take bribes, and right, you right. can <laughs> talk. we can talk about it at Vegas. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate you for being honest about that, Max. You're honest in your scumbaggery, and I'm... I, exactly, I, I am an that. honest scumbag. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's take a look at this deck. Bant Super Friends, and... We had a few questions here for Jeff. Um, so the meta in his shop is either CEDH or fives and sixes. So everyone either goes all in or we're looking at, you know, five and six. I usually think of that is 75% ish range is what I would say. He would like this to be a strong seven or eight on the power scale, which I'm assuming he's hoping it can hang with both a CEDH level deck and a 75% deck. He was inspired to build super friends after listening to us build our super friends decks. And he was going to go straight to Selesnia, but he had Estrid sitting around and he couldn't help himself, and he wanted to add blue for the value. The goal is to put out some tokens to protect his planeswalkers, allowing him to get tons of value from walkers until he can drop a giant token maker and swarm in for the win. Yeah, uh, the biggest weakness is that it takes time to get things going, and it's very challenging to get the, get to the mid to late game where the deck really starts to hum. Uh, for budget, uh, he said about twenty dollars a card, or keep everything under two dollars, two hundred dollars, not twenty two dollars, but two hundred. <laughs> so let's dive in, I guess. Start. So yeah, so we're looking at a average CMC of three point seven one in a three color deck. That's a little bit higher than I would like, but it's a three color deck, and it's running super friends. It's a planeswalker deck, so to a degree, that's kind of tough to avoid as well. 
Um, the concentration of cards is pretty heavy into the four drops. So there's about 17 four drops versus 12 threes and 10 two drops. So that's where the bottleneck is going to be. Um, I think it costs four mana. And he's running 35 lands. So let's just start Ooh. looking at the lands because 35 is pretty tight in a three color deck with that high of a CMC, I think. What do you think, Max? Um, I mean, I run 30. Five in my two Vasa deck, but that has a CMC of 2.8. So, um, so there's a couple things here, too, I would also mention. He's got a good amount of basics. There's 25 basics here. And that's good on one hand because you're like you're you're defending yourself against Blood Moons and back to basics, and your lands always come into play <laughs> untapped. However, you're in a three-color deck where you need to have access to as many color combinations as possible, and you're only running 35 lands, um, I think that's not an ideal combination. I think you're going to have a, a, too many games where you don't have the combos you need, and with running that few lands, it's going to be tough to get to those combinations you need. Yeah. Um, to note, he is running back to basics himself. Yep, that's true. That's a good point. Um, I think he's running a lot of the... Land auras, you know, your Verdant, yeah. Verdant Havens, your Utopia Sprawls. Um, like we mentioned a few weeks back on the previous Estrid show we did, I like those, but I like yeah. the ones that make you two mana, the land plus something extra. Because there's so Some much value are, with that untap thing with her. Right. I get why he's running them over other ramp spells, which we'll get into later, but I still think 35 is super low and, you know, just even going to 36 might be safe and it'll help you get to the late game or mid game a little faster than being stuck on two lands for four turns. Well, I mean, yeah. And, and you mentioned the, the untapped things like, like Verdant Haven or like, um, Fertile Ground, um, Dawn's Reflection kind of spells. Um, and I, I actually, Wild Growth is not in here, and I think Wild Growth is super efficient at one mana. I would be very tempted to run that as well. But as good as those are and as useful as they are in an Estra deck in general, you also need to have enough mana in play to cast those in the first place. Yes. And I think that's going to be the problem here a little bit, as I think you're going to hit those situations where you're holding, you know, you draw that great hand where you're like, oh, I have three of these lands and three of these uh, land auras in play. I'm going to make a gazillion mana but I only have one or two lands and it's not going to get me there. Like I can't cast anything until I hope I draw a land and at 35, then you, you might go three or four turns sometimes without, without doing that. Um, I, I agree. I think 36 would just feel a little bit better. Um, and, and with that high CMC, I, I don't think 37 is crazy either, but I, I would like to see that number go slightly higher. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, um, Bant Panorama, okay. I guess, is also one I don't entirely love. Um, it goes and fetches you a land, um, and it, but it only gets a basic, so it's not fixing anything necessarily. Um, and the land comes into play tapped, and it costs one to use. Um, in a late game, I guess, you can play it as a colorless source, and there's not much downside to it. I just, but, but like it also, you're, you're back to basics, Rex it too if you're using it for that purpose. I don't know. I feel like I would probably just run a City of Brass there or something. Or yep, Command City Tower. Of... There's no Command Tower here. Just run Command Tower maybe. Yeah. Command Tower, City of Brass, Mana Confluence. Uh, anything that's going to make colored mana, I think uh, at this point you want to stick to lands that make colored mana even though you have, uh, like you said, 25 basics in the deck. Yeah. And, and I get that maybe the thought process there, too, is you're going to almost always turn it into a basic land um, in, in case you have back-to-basics out. So maybe that's what the thought process is. But even then, I would still think I would rather just run one of the actual good fetches that don't make something come into play tapped. Because you can still get a basic if you want to. But if you don't want to, you can go grab that breeding pool. You can go grab that canopy vista. You can go grab that um, temple garden if you want to. Yep. And that's some other stuff that could be improved on. You know, he's running Breeding Pool. He has all three shocks. Um, he has both the Battle Bond yep. duels that could go in this deck. But for the rest of the duels, like the check lands from the core sets and Ixalan, or even uh, the Canopy Vista lands, the Battle for Zendikar lands, 
uh, he's missing the other one or two of, depending on what cycle we're talking about. Yeah. An- uh, right there, that would help a ton. Yes. Um, another one I would maybe consider, although I, I'm not entirely sold on it, is um, is Tularia West, just because, again, it kind of will let you, if you need to, just go get a basic um, of a different color if you want to. But I think in this deck, Karn's Bastion is such a beating. Being able to put those extra counters on those Planeswalkers changes the math. Um it, it's it's an absolute house in my Super Friends deck, and my Super Friends deck is not as good as this, <laughs> being mono white. Um, I think having something that that's just in a land slot, so it's not sucking up a spell slot, that lets you basically spend three mana to turn it into Karn's Bastion, is probably worth the mana, or or, yeah. or, or worth it coming into play tapped. If you already have Karn's Bastion, now then you're like, oh well, it's just an island that comes into play tapped, and that's not ideal. But I think there's going to be times when you're like, oh, I'm going to go get Karn's Bastion right now with this, play it, proliferate this stuff, screw everybody up because I didn't think I could, hit, I could ult this turn, and I'm going to ult this turn. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so other than that, yeah, I, I think the, the, the back to basics thing really does change the math here a, a little bit. And, and um, I like that, too. It's it's a different enough thing. like Because we talk about that. Like if people aren't – if people in your meta aren't running back to basics or Blood Moon kind of effects – you can be super, super greedy, and he's the person that's doing it. He's running the back to basics, so maybe he's, right. he's punishing those greedy people like me, and that's probably good. Uh, let's go look at artifacts right now. Only five artifacts in this deck. What are they, Max? Oh, I scrolled the wrong way. Look at that. <laughs> Lambs, artifacts. There they are. Excellent. Uh, so we have Commander Sphere, Contagion Engine, Felwar Stone, Navinriel's Disc, and Soul Ring. Soul Ring is obviously great. Commander Sphere, we are both a fan of generally. Um, being able to sack it when you need to and just draw a card when it's not being used, super, super valuable. And, then, and we've said this before, I think, but like the fact that you can sack it after you tap it is so, so good. Yes. Uh, Contagion Engine is another proliferate effect here that I like a lot. And it's, a, it's a double one, technically. So for 10 mana, you get two extra counters on things. That is super, super good. And again, in my White Planeswalker deck... Um, it's a beating, so I, I like that card here. Foulwar Stone's just a cheap, efficient mana rock. Um, and in a three-color deck, it's probably basically a better Signet most of the time. It's going to make you two colors, if not all three, depending on what's going on. Uh, Nev Disc, being able to use a, a, a slot for something that destroys most of your stuff, and it's an artifact slot, so you don't care about the mana. Um, it's fine. I don't love it because people can see it coming, but... It doesn't blow up his Planeswalkers, yeah. but it is a, it's a Rattlesnake card uh, through and through. Um, definitely something I don't want to see in my hand late game when I yes. have control of the game. Correct. But it gets around your walkers, so, you know, there's not a lot of downside to it, but... No. It also blows up your tokens. Yeah. Oof. So so what do you think of the artifacts here? Anything you change out? Um, I... I'm not a fan of Felwar Stone. I get that it's cheap, um, and it makes you know gen- generic mana worst case. But in a three-color deck, and if you need it to make a colored mana because you only have 35 lands, um, and you're not playing anybody in Bant on the off chance, you're kind of hosed for a while. Yeah, uh, um, I and, and we've again we we talk about Chromatic Lantern a lot. Um, and in a th- I think in a three-color deck where you have so little color fixing um, in terms of lands that make multiple colors because there's so many basics, I think that makes Chromatic Lantern even more valuable. Um, you know, two mana is where it's at for ramp. I get it, and I love two mana stuff. I just think the upside for a Chromatic Lantern being able to perfectly fix your mana base is so worth it. I think I'd make that move. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the smart play overall. Um, otherwise, I'd like the rest of them. You know, Contagion Engine can knock out some opponent's stuff and then proliferate, proliferate all of your uh, Planeswalkers that you end up playing. Yeah, yep. Um, I, I like those. I, I do think I, I'm a little bit um, surprised that we're not seeing um, Chain Veil in here. It's expensive. It's not a cheap card at all, Um 
So maybe that's that's it. Like I I cracked a couple of them back in. That was an Origins, right? Uh, M15. M15. Okay, so I cracked a couple of them back in. So I actually just like, hey, I built a Super Friends deck. I'm throwing a Chain Veil in it, but it's a twenty dollar card. It's definitely up there. Um, in a Super Friends deck, though, it's it's the equivalent of doubling season to a token deck. I think um, it's worth that. You know, skipping my, I'm gonna skip my Starbucks once a week for the next month and save my five bucks and go buy a Chain Veil. Um, if you make no other changes to this deck, I feel like f- at some point saving up to get a Chain Veil in here is worth it. Yeah, I that it it definitely deserves a spot in this deck. Um, I do also like um, Contagion Clasp. It's only two mana versus six for Contagion Engine. It does still cost four to activate, and you want to get the one proliferate effect. But the proliferate stuff in a Super Friends deck is so, so strong that I think it's worth the slot to have a, a weaker version of Contagion Engine, although I guess it's more efficient to cast. I think that's worth the slot. And the other one that's kind of a, a similar kind of card is Throne of Geth. Um, I actually put Throne of Geth in my Jero deck originally because I didn't have a Contagion Engine, and I had a Throne of Geth. Throne of Geth is two mana, and you can tap it to sacrifice an artifact and proliferate. Um, I almost never... I, occasionally I sacrifice something else, like, oh, my Soul Ring, I don't need it anymore, I'll sacrifice it. But most of the time, I just sacrifice Throne of Geth to itself for two mana to put an additional counter on every one of your Planeswalkers. If that's all you ever use it for is that one activation to put one more counter on your Planeswalkers, it's worth it. And if you can eke an extra activation or two out by, by hitting your Soul Ring and hitting your Commanders from you don't need them... It's amazing, and I would recommend taking at least a look at it. I, do, I was just testing it out, or not even testing it out. It was a substitute for a Contagion Engine until I got one. I cast it two or three times and realized I, I didn't want to pull it out. I pulled something else out when I got the Contagion Engine in. Interesting. So. Hmm. Okay. But I love, I, I just like, as good as Proliferate stuff is in Super Friends decks, the, the additional ones we got in... Um, Modern Horizons made my mono white deck so much better. And uh, in a real Super Friends deck, a real, you know, in band colors where you have actually really good planeswalkers, um, yeah. I, I feel like it's just, it's just that much better. Same with Chain Fail. Uh, all right, let's um, move on here and maybe take a look at the few creatures he's running. Uh, there's only six here. There's Argovian Elder, which lets you untap two target lands. Makes sense, I think, both with the enchantments here um, on those lands. It's going to generate extra mana. Um, there's a Bio Essence Hydra, which has Trample, and it comes into play with a plus one counter on it for each loyalty counter on Planeswalkers you control. And whenever one or more loyalty counters are put on Planeswalkers you control, put that many plus one counters on Bio Essence Hydra. There are times that's just going to turn into something disgustingly large and kill somebody. Yeah, For f- especially when you can, you know, it's five mana, yeah. and then the next turn you play uh, Elspeth's Sons Champion, who comes in with four loyalty counters. Yeah. Boom. Or Teferi Temporal Archmage with five loyalty counters. And then use that Chain Veil or, some, or, or a proliferate effect to, you know, put additional ones on there. Yeah. Uh, perfect deck for it. So, I... I Wish that card was mono white. Yeah. Um, there's Champion of Lamholt. Creatures with less power than Champion of Lamholt's power can't block creatures you control. Um, what do you think of this one? You just drafted this card in our uh, Vegas Rotisserie draft. I did. Um, you know, there are a lot of token makers in this deck, and I've never really played with this card in any token decks I've built in the past, so I'm looking forward to using it, and I think it's going to be something that you can blow someone out of the water with, especially with other cards uh, in this deck like Doubling Season and Pure Imaginative Let Rascal and all the proliferate stuff. It's going to get large uh, very quickly. It's a way to, it's it's one additional way to help those tokens win a game. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like it here. Um, I've never ran it in a deck, but it's one of those cards I've always like eyeballed as a possible include, and if I've just never managed to um, find a home for it, but it's a really, really solid card, and I like seeing it show up here. Next on our list here, we have Evolution Sage, 
which is a new card from uh, War of the Spark, I believe. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, proliferate. Why can't that be mono white, Max? Um, because no. <laughs> yeah, um, and that, that's a, that's just a beater here. Um, you don't have many ways in this deck where you're going to probably generate multiple landfall triggers per turn. There's a couple fetches in the deck. Um, so unlike a lot of green decks where you're going to oftentimes be ramping out lands, there's not quite that much here doing that, but it's worth it if you're just doing normal one land for the turn stuff. Yep. So that is one I like to see here as well. Um, let's see. Then we have... Uh, Peer, Imaginative Rascal, I mean, and, and Toothy as well. Number one, there's some serious value there because when you cast one, you can go pull the other one into your hand. So it's almost like a, a, a perfect draw spell um, stapled onto each half. And both those halves are, relative, are, are, are relevant here for the most part. Yep, for sure. In the, there, Anything you'd want to add? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um <laughs> Let's see. Uh, for creatures, um, Flux Channeler, I think it kind of does that Evolution Sage thing. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, Proliferate. Um, I think it's just too much value to pass up. I think the fact that you're, you're just going to put Planeswalkers... You're putting counters on your Planeswalkers whenever you cast a Planeswalker spell. I, that synergy is just too good. Um, I also think Grateful Apparition... <laughs> does a ton of work for me in my mono white deck i'd be tempted to run that and guild pack informant they both have evasion there's almost always going to be a soft target that you can get through and when you get through being able to put a counter on all those planeswalkers at least for me like maybe this deck has enough of those effects to do it already but i think both of those creatures are absolute houses and i would be very tempted to run both of them in this deck Okay, I went the completely opposite way. I went okay. with stuff that makes tokens. Oh, that's true. I, I mean, yeah, no. So what, what did you have for suggestions here? Uh, I, I went with Hangerback Walker okay. and Chasm Skulker. So Hangerback Walker, oh, yeah. it, it's just a, it's a good card. Yes. Uh, you know, you, it's very modular in the fact that early game you can cast it for, you know, two or four and make it a 1-1 one, one or a 2-2 two, two, and yep. then use its ability to add a counter or proliferate the counter. Late game... You can cast it for 10, 12, make it a 5, 5, 6, 6. Yep. But, and then, you know, when it dies, it's, ch- it's going to chump block, and you're going to get all these tokens to use for the next couple turns that have evasion. Yeah. And then Chasm Skulker is the same thing. Anytime you draw a card, it gets a plus one, plus one counter on it, and uh, then you sacrifice it away, or it dies, and you make all those squid tokens. So it pairs really well with Toothy. Yes. Because Toothy says, when I leave the battlefield, draw cards. Right. You're going to draw 18 cards. You're going to make your Chasm Skulker plus 18 plus 18. It's a very good synergy right there between the two. Yeah, for sure. Any uh, other creature stuff before I move on here? That is it from me. Uh, how about the instance? What do we have there, Max? Okay. So for instance, there are 13. We have uh, Cyclonic Rift, Enlightened Tutor, Heroic Intervention, Ignite the Beacon, Cross and Grip, March of the Multitudes, Negate, Rapid Hybridization, Second Harvest, Secure the Waste, Stroke of Genius, Sundering Growth, and Swords to Plowshares. So what do you think of this collection of stuff here? Um, so I think you're already running Rapid Hybridization. It's one mana, it's a beast within effect, but only for creatures. Yep. I think slotting in Beast Within and Generous Gift, just to complete the, the package, is smart. Yes, um, absolutely. I, I think I would run Beast Within or Generous Gift over over Hybridization for sure. Yep. Um, you're paying two more mana. That's not, like, at some point, it's one of those things where, like, cards progressively cost more and do more things, and at some point, you're like, why don't you just pay 10 mana and do, like, this, you know, this card that does 15 things. Like, there, there's some balance there where, at some point, you pay too much. I think, on a recent show, we were talking about Win Grace's Judgment. It hits three different targets, but it's five mana, and you're like, maybe that's the point where it's too much. But I think paying two more over rapid hybridization... Oh, so, so let's take the next step. Paying one more from hybridization to go to reality shift that is an exile effect is yeah. is, is probably worth it um 
I'd be content to exchange that for Path to Exile, although it's a $10 card, um, versus Reality Shift that's only two. Um, Beast Within, though, is only like a dollar, is a couple bucks, but like... Uh, it's it's a, just above a dollar because it's getting reprinted in the Commander pre Oh, okay, there we go. So like, I think that would be a good swap. I think Generous Gift would be perfectly fine there. I, I think you have so many available options in Bant that... I wouldn't settle for hybridization. I would run one of the other one, one of the five other cards we just mentioned in that slot. Yep. Um, the other one I'm not a big fan of is Sundering Growth. I understand that it's a, it's an artifact and enchantment removal spell, and then you get to populate. Yep. Um, knowing that your board is based on your tokens, I think something such as Rootborn Defenses is just better here. It's a little easier to cast, even though it's one more mana. It's not hybrid Selesnia Selesnia. It's two and a white. Yes. And it makes all your creatures indestructible until end populate, and then creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. It, it depends, I guess, what he wants it for more. If he wants it for if he wants it for a removal, destroying the artifact or enchantment, and he's treating the populate like a bonus. I still think like this isn't a deck that's got 6-6 six, six tokens or 10-10 ten, ten tokens where, like, making a second one of those tokens is huge. Making an additional 1-1 one, one probably isn't that big of a deal. And I think, again, Generous Gift or Beast Within, being able to hit any target, I think, is worth not getting the 1-1 one, one token. So I think that's a trade I would make if if you're looking at it as at a removal spell. And if you're looking at as a token maker, I think there's better ways to do it, too. And I don't think having both on one card is worth not having the versatility of a better removal spell or not having the ability to make like two or three tokens off something that's going to make multiple tokens. Yeah. So, um, you know, we often talk about how much we like cards that do multiple things. But, but I think the caveat there is we like cards that do multiple things really, really well. And I don't think this does those things well enough to be worth the trade-off. Yeah. Um, Stroke of Genius is is one I am always um, unsure of. I, I understand the versatility and the usage where if you have infinite mana, you can deck somebody. Um, is this deck making infinite mana, though? No, it can make a lot of mana, but... You can make a good. Not you, you can make a good bit with Estrid and untapping multiple things. Um, it, I just don't like it. Then, like, okay, four mana to draw one card, five mana to draw two, six mana to draw three. I just, I, I think that's not. That's really inefficient. No, there. I think there are just better sorcery speed draw spells that should be in this deck. Or better, instant, over... there's better instant speed draw spells even. Like, like if you want an instant speed one, you can find ones that are that you know. At some point, Stroke was going to outscale it at 10 mana or something, but like, yeah, I, I just don't, I'm not a huge fan of it just in general. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I'm going to make a better, you know, cast Harmonize most of the time and just draw three cards for four mana and leave my blue mana free for one of the couple counter spells here. Yeah. Uh, Enlightened Tutors is good in any deck. Um, I think the ability to go get uh, Doubling Season alone is probably worth Enlightened Tutor slot. I think. If you were to run the Chain Veil here, that would give you a second game-breaking target to go get with it, so that makes complete sense. Uh, Heroic Intervention, we both love that card. Um, however, I think I would probably run, if I had to choose, and obviously budget is a thing, I, I would pick Teferi's Protection first. Um, I would not. You would not? Okay, why is that? Because budget's a thing. It is. You're right. Absolutely yes, right. Yes, it, it's it's a great addition. I would run. I'd run to Fairy's Protection over Sundering Growth. To be honest. So if they were, um, if they were the same price, if if to Fairy's Protection was the same price as Heroic Intervention, is there one that you would choose over the other? No, I'd get them both. Well, <laughs> I, you know what? I tend to agree. I think I would run both as well. If if I um, assuming I had access to both of them, I, I don't think that's a choice I would make. I would just run both of them. Yeah, the the one I mean, Teferi's protection is one more mana. Yeah, the you know your life total can't change. That's a big upside yeah. on it. So you know, but at the same time, having two ways to make sure your stuff doesn't die is just good. Yes, and heroic intervention is already in the deck. So yep. if that's 
one of those things where you, you know, want to save up or trade some cards in or something. Yeah. You know, then go get that Teferi's Protection. Yeah. Uh, this is a perfect deck for March of the Multitudes because you can convoke those those tokens that you left back as blockers and instant speed, too. So, like, they're left there as yeah. blockers. End of your turn, I'm going to tap these six tokens and dump this, you know, seven mana I have left and make a pile of things that are going to come screaming at you next turn. Mm-hmm. So, perfect deck for that. Uh, the only counter spell in the deck is Negate. I think something like a Swan Song should be in this deck, or even like Arcane Denial, so you have a card draw source. I, I agree. Um, I don't dislike Negate. I think Negate, if I'm running like six counter spells in a in a Bant deck, Negate's in that list. I think if I'm running one, <clears throat> I'm probably running Arcane Denial. It hits. Yeah. It's it's hits everything, and. Creatures are relevant in this format. Now, maybe in this meta they aren't. Maybe you never see a Crater Hoof or you never see that, um, uh, what's the awful worm from, um, shoot. The w- Crawl Worm? Your card you always yeah, no, talk yeah, about? No, um, <laughs> a Toxon Worm? From, um, uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to edit this. Um, the, Sorry, from, Ken. From Mirrodin. That, that makes all creatures get minus two, minus two. Massacre there Worm. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That yeah. Took, that took a while. <laughs> so maybe you're in a meta where you never see that Crater Hoof Behemoth or that Massacre Worm. And this deck in particular doesn't want to see a Massacre Worm come down when you're sitting at like 14 tokens. Um, maybe you never see that and that's in the gate does the job. But I think that there are enough situations where you do see those creatures or you see that Elish Norn that's going to wreck your day. Um, that I would want to solve any problem, and I think Arcane Denial solves any problem for a single blue mana and a colorless, but you don't have to leave double blue up, which can be a challenge in three colors. So if I was running one counter spell, it would be Arcane Denial over Negate. So here's what I've kind of found just between playing in our shop or even at other GPs we've gone to this year. Yeah. Uh, especially in my three color deck. One counterspell does not feel like enough. I think there's enough removal out in the wild where relying on a single negate or a single swan song isn't going to get you to win the game because you're either going to have it when you don't want it or you're not going to have it when you want it. I've never tried running one counterspell. Um, I will say this, just when I go to build a deck, um, because I have blue decks that have none and I have blue decks that have, you know, six ish i always feel like i want one or the other i either want a suite of counter spells that i'm going to be able to solve a couple different problems in the average game because you're never going to see all six but like i'm going to see if i'm running six or seven i'm going to see two to three probably if i'm going 10 turns and my games usually do and i usually draw a lot of cards um i i feel like i either want to see a couple or i just want to like not have to rely on them i feel like one it seems strange, but like I, I, but but I've never ran that, so I can't speak to that. Just mentally, like yeah. one seems like I want to either have five or I want to have none, but I don't know if I want to run one. But I've never, right. But I've never experienced that, so maybe that makes no sense. Um, so I, I have. When I first built Tuvasa, I put a single counter spell in that deck. I put a, I put a pact of negation in there because I had an extra one. Yep. You know, I was sorting cards that hadn't been bindered, um, knowing that. Oh. I have one counter spell in this deck and I know you just, you know, tutored for something or right. someone just misco tutored a rift to their top of their deck. I know I have to find that one spell in my deck with the four cards I'm going to cast this turn because I have a draw engine enabled. Yeah. Does not make me feel easy. Sure. Now if you want to err on the side of caution, make sure this deck stays most closer to the the 6 to 7 range versus the 7 to 8 range. Maybe then you just know, yep, uh, I only have one counter spell yeah, in my deck. Right. Uh, I have three ways to f- try to find it right now by drawing two or three cards. Um, maybe that's fine. Right. But if you want to stay in that, that seven to eight range, one more makes me feel a lot more comfortable. And, you know, it's not budget friendly. And, you know, of course, neither is Tularia West, which I mentioned in the land area. But another nice thing about Tularia West is if you're running something like Pact of Negation, Tulare West lets you go grab Pact of Negation, so at least would double your chances of having that counterspell in hand if you happen to put in Tulare West, 
then maybe you would consider pact and negation as your other counter spell just because it gives you a way to tutor that up if you're in a situation. Yep. But again, my, neither of those are cheap cards and, you know, budgets, like you said, are a thing. Yeah. Anything else in here? Nope, I think I'm good for instance. I mean, Secure the Waste is great. Second Harvest is a card I... Second Harvest is disgusting plenty of times, so that's all good. I like the rest of the stuff here. Ignite the Beacon, instant speed, grab two Planeswalkers at the end of turn. Fantastic, so I like the rest of that. Cyclonic Rift, obviously completely broken and it's going to get banned in six months, but until then... Be quiet. Until then, be a scumbag, because I certainly am. How about the sorceries? Okay, we have 11 sorceries. We have Call the Gatewatch, Collective Effort, Devout Invocation, Finale of Glory, Gelatinous Genesis, Hour of Reckoning, Martial Coup, Mass Calcify, Plea for Guidance, Rampant Growth, and Supply Demand. Where do you want to start? Um, so Call the Gatewatch I will start with. Um, now, granted, my Jiru deck has the advantage of having a uh, commander that goes and gets a planeswalker, and at some point I felt like I didn't need to run Call the Gatewatch. Um, and also, this deck has a little bit higher CMC, and you know, we've been talking about paying one extra for Reality Shift or two extra for Beast Within, that kind of thing. So, I don't want to keep suggesting more expensive cards. <laughs> but again, I think at sorcery speed to go get a planeswalker, three mana is a lot, and I don't think that's quite, I don't think that's that effect is worth three mana, particularly when you could just run something like Jeru for five, and he's going to leave behind a 4-3 blocker, and he's going to reduce damage dealt to your other Planeswalkers. I think if I'm going to spend three mana to go get a Planeswalker, I'd rather spend five mana and have it leave behind a blocking body that I can swing with if I need to that's also going to keep my Planeswalkers safe. So, um, hmm. I, I don't know if I necessarily love um, either option, but but I think if I was going to run that, I would just run Jeru. Maybe even Thalia's Lancers instead. Thalia's Lancers is five mana to go get a legendary card, which is every single Planeswalker. Again, it's going to leave behind a body, but it's a legendary card, not just Planeswalker. So, like, it will go get that Chain Veil if you happen to have a Chain Veil in your deck. It will go get... Um, I mean, I, Pure and toothy. Yeah, right. It'll, it'll go grab something else. It'll, it will flex into getting those if you need it to. I, I think. I think call the gatewatch isn't worth maybe the um, the mana for it. And I think if you're going to spend, I would rather spend a couple more and get a much better effect. I think this is a situation where it's worth the upgrade. Okay, fair enough. I didn't really have an opinion on this card. I just saw it goes gets a planeswalker, and yep. that's fine. I think Collective Effort's a really solid card. Devout Invocation. Can, can we go back? I disagree. Okay, you don't. You don't. You think it's not. You think this is not quite enough? No. So it's a sorcery for one white white. Yep. Choose one or more. Uh, destroy target creature with power four or greater. Destroy target enchantment. Put a plus one plus one counter on each creature. Target player controls, and then it has Escalate, which you can tap and untap creature you control for every mode chosen. So it's three mana and. Uh, convoke two essentially. So, in, um, in, in a token deck, I'm going to guess probably quite often you're paying the escal the double escalate. Yes, because you can afford um, it because you probably have so many creatures out. You know, even if it's only like five creatures, usually you're like, oh, I can tap two of my soul of chump blockers and I can get the triple effect. So, looking at this at three mana to do all three of those things, probably pretty frequently. Um, that's, you know what? That's a good point. I'm glad you brought me back because for some reason I thought it was destroy target artifact or enchantment. It's just enchantment. It's just one. I would rather pay five mana for something like Cleansing Nova, six mana for Austere Command, or even the new one, Crush Contraband. Or four for Crush Contraband. Yes. Or spend two just for uh, like the Glamour or Night of the Aether. Or spend three again for the Generous Gift or Beast Within. Yep. And solve any or, problem. Or if your main concern is the removal of the enchantment, run one more, play, pay one more, and run Pierce Whim so you can ramp. Yeah. No. And you hit three things because you get each opponent. Yep. I I, I, I do think the next card though. I think Devout Invocation. This is a great deck for it. <laughs> I want to disagree with you again. Okay. Why is that? Um. So as of this point, there's no vigilance in this deck. 
And, so and, there's, no, and if, there's no haste either. There's no way to grant things. There's no haste. So if you want to cast this after combat, and let's say you swung out with more than half of your per, more than half of your tokens, yep. you know, if you have ten tokens, let's say you swung with six of them, you're spending seven mana tapping four creatures that might be bigger than four fours for whatever reason. Sure. To make four four fours. That seems like a giant inefficiency of mana, in my opinion. Okay, well, so how about this? I'll say this instead. If, um, yeah, okay, no, we can just delete my babbling there because I was going to say something else, but if, it, it doesn't make sense. So, Especially because there's, we'll cover this in enchantments, but there's a divine visitation yeah. in this deck. Yeah. So worst case, if that's out it's and a you spend then. six mana on this, you're tapping angels to make more angels. I don't like that. Um, I think something fun to, to make this more of the, you know, maybe like a, a medium powered seven, spend the extra mana and cast Storm Herd. Sure, sure. And, and then that combos with um, Divine Visitation. Yeah, you make all those 2 2 Pegasi into 4 4 Angels. And let's say you're at 28 life. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You convinced me again, Max. Oh, I'm, I'm batting 100 tonight. <laughs> how, about, how about Finale of Glory? Uh, I love this card. I, dr- I drafted it in my Vegas Rotisserie draft. You did. I, ca- I cannot wait to cast it. Um, I mean, if you cast that for 12, that's just a beating. That, that's, that's 12 4 4 yeah. angels, 12 <laughs> 2 2 soldiers. That's a lot of power on board. How about Gelatinous Genesis? That's a, a kind of um, an obscure card from uh, back in the Zendikar, original Zendikar block. Put X, XX green ooze creature tokens onto the battlefield. But it's double X to cast, so like, yeah. if, you spend, so, if you're spending three mana, you're making, what, two one ones. If you spend five mana, you're making, um, it's going to be two two twos. Yeah, um, this is this is where I put Hanger back. Yes, I, I um, agree, yep. It was a very obvious cut for me, is just put Hanger back here. It's one less mana, and it... It flux, it goes better, and it's a creature. It's yep. easier to remove what you want to happen. Yes. Uh, the board wipes. You have Marshall Coup. You have um, Hour of Reckoning there. Um, Mass Calcify. What are your thoughts about Mass Calcify? Um, so most of the tokens he makes are white or white yep. and green. Yep. I don't dislike it, but I think it's sort of inefficient at seven mana. Again, I'd rather run Austere Command at six, so you have a little more modular versatility. Wrath of God just kills everything. If you're going to play seven mana, isn't Planar Cleansing seven mana, or is that eight? Uh, I think it's seven. But that hits your Planeswalkers, yeah. but if you're behind on board and it's worth giving up a Planeswalker that interacts with uh, you know, tokens and you have no creatures, who cares? I, I think that... Um... Austere Command probably would save your creatures as often as Mass Calcify does, more or less, and has more versatility, too. Um, I would prefer that, I think, over Mass Calcify. Yeah. How about Plea for Guidance? Search your library for up to two enchantment cards. Read them, put them in your hand. Six mana, but it gets two enchantments, and there's a lot of enchantments in here that will absolutely house somebody. Um. If you want to spend the money on the upgrade, go buy an idyllic tutor. Yes, and if this is in there until I think mean, this is a this is a perfectly legitimate use of six mana until you can find an idyllic tutor or until it gets reprinted for a reasonable amount of money. Yeah, uh, rampant growth is obviously a good um, way to go get lands. Um, I would you know nature's lore is only like a buck more, and it does give you the option to grab that breeding pool, but you don't have to. I think that it's worth your dollar to have the versatility. I think it wouldn't be worth it if the only option was three visits. I wouldn't tell you right. to do that, but I think at Nature's Lore at a buck fifty is worth that upgrade. Or even Sky Shroud claim because he is running all the green yeah. duels. It can go get forests. But, that, but um, that is bumping his CMC up, and we're we've already offered well, a couple suggestions that, that knock it even more. But yeah, I I, I, I do think I, I wouldn't. Like, I would run Farseek over Rampant Growth here. Yes, I would as well. So. The only thing I think that this is missing is draw. This deck in overall is weak on draw. Yeah. Um, but, so something like Tezzeret Scambit would be great in this deck because yes. you can pay the Phyrexian mana for it. You draw two and then yep. you proliferate or proliferate, then draw two, whatever the order is. Yeah. Um, 
It interacts with your points walkers. Yep. It interacts with a little bit of plus one, plus one counter stuff you have going on. It seems like an auto-include. Yeah, a contentious plan as well. I guess it doesn't really draw you because it only draws you a single card. Um, but it's only two mana, and it does a proliferate effect as well. I think that's probably, I think that, again, that's kind of like that Throne of Geth situation. I think it's almost worth the slot just to use a proliferate once, and the fact that it replaces itself is gravy. So I would kind of, yeah. I, I would I would not mind seeing that in here somewhere as well. Um, supply and demand, what are your thoughts on about, about that one here? Um, so supply makes, so it's the split card from the original Ravnica block, yep. so I think this one's from Dissension. Uh, supply says X green white, put X one one green sapling creature tokens into play. And then demand is one white blue. Uh, search your library for a multicolored card, reveal it, and put it into the into your hand and shuffle your library. I feel like this is mainly used for supply. Um, and if that's the case, I would rather run aura mutation because it's a it's a kill spell for uh, enchantments and you make that many one one sapperlings. Yeah. And it's instant speed. Yeah. Um, otherwise, um, I'm looking like ready and willing is from uh, Gate Dragon's Maze. It's a fuse card. One green white gives all your creatures uh, indestructible, I think, until end of turn. And then one black white gives them death touch and lifelink until end of turn. So you can fuse it for the whole six mana. Yep. Great way to just make sure you can save your board or get rid of someone else's board and gain a bunch of life. Anything else you have here under sorceries? Um, just maybe a little more draw. We talked about yeah. Tenders Gambit, but, uh, and, you know, maybe better ramp, whether it's uh, just upgrading that nature's lore to the f- upgrading rampant growth to nature's lore or far seek, like you mentioned as well. Yep. How about the enchantments? Um, six, yeah, so en- 16 total here. And we, oh, we can do that again. Sorry, Ken, we're making you do extra work. Uh, how about the enchantments, Max, for 16 total here? Yeah, so uh, Anointed Procession, Awakening Zone, Back to Basics, Cathar's Crusade, Dawn's Reflection, Divine Visitation, Doubling Season, Fertile Ground, Inexonorable Tide, uh, Market Festival, Marari's Wake, Mystic Remora, Oath of Teferi, Smothering Tithe, Urban Utopia, and Verdant Haven. Well, so here's the thing about these kind of decks. There's so many good enchantments that do so much work here. Yes. Um, let's look at the, the the land aura ones first, because this works really nicely with Estrid. We, and we've, I guess we've touched on this, but we haven't really... We've mentioned Estrid's minus one, but we probably should specify what that is. She has an, an ability where she can put a aura um, enchantment token named Mask and, Mask and attach to a permanent and that has totem armor. And so you can put that on a land or put it on anything, basically. Um, her plus two, though, untaps each enchanted permanent you control. So, you know, you can put those masks on your lands and untap them with her plus two, but those auras that you're casting here just then do that for you. So, like, if you drop two or three of these auras in your lands and you plus two her, then you're untapping the lands that you've already tapped for mana and gotten the bonus from the aura, and then you can do it again. So, like, her plus two turns that land from making one mana to because there's an aura on it that's presumably making one or two to making you know three mana and then untapping to make six so you can make a ton of mana with estrid um however i think like like one of the ones he's running here is verdant haven which is three mana um it gains utility when it comes into play and whenever enchanted land is tapped for mana its controller adds one mana of any color to their mana pool it's only making you one extra mana for that three cost to enchant it. Wild growth costs one to cast and makes you one. The two makes you an extra green specifically. It's green specifically, but I feel like the, the two yeah, I get the, the two saying. life is irrelevant, and I don't think it's worth spending the additional two mana for the fixing. I think wild growth is just so efficient. It's one of those ones. It's worth paying less for the efficiency because I don't think two mana extra is worth the the upgrade just to get any color. Correct. Other than that, I like most of those. I think they work really well in this deck. Um, and the rest of these enchantments are all just things that are just backbreaking. Awakening Zone, I guess, is just valuable. Like, Anointed Procession is disgusting. And, you know, Doubling Season is doubly disgusting because it doubles your Planeswalkers and your tokens in this deck. Divine Visitation, Catholic Crusade, 
those cards win games. Mar Marty's Wake yep. makes so much value and it buffs your tokens. This is a perfect deck for that. Smothering Tithe, you're getting double tokens if, if doubling season's out. I mean, all these are monsters. Um, yep. Is there anything for, for all these value ones that you would trade or add or change here? I you're you're missing the third like the third musketeer of those token <laughs> but, enchantments and that would be uh per parallel, parallel lives. lives yep I, I mean it's it's 15 bucks it's it's it is not a cheap card but, anymore but i mean you have doubling season so you know i would i would re really recommend grabbing that one as well and i think it just takes the place of something like i was just looking at it fertile ground is that the ford mana one nope uh Market Festival, that's the four mana yeah. land or a, a four mana to, you know, make two extra mana isn't great, especially if you have to tap out for it. Um, I don't mind tapping out for Parallel Lives knowing I'm going to roll up Elspeth's Sun's Champion this turn. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, I know the math doesn't make sense, listeners, that I have a six mana Planeswalker and now I have to tap out <laughs> for four, but whatever. Um I'd rather do that than tap out to add two mana next turn. Well, I talked about skipping your Starbucks for a month so you can save up to buy that um, Chain Veil. After I did that, the next thing I would skip my Starbucks for to chase, save it to buy is Parallel Lives. That's yeah. the next card in this this one that I think um, is also just backbreaking, and I would I would look for a slot for that here as well. So. Yep. Uh, my final two are, you know, I talk about Brave the Sands a lot. It's been a card I've been really impressed with. The last few months in my deck building and playing, giving all your tokens vigilance and the ability to block an extra creature is really great in a go wide deck, yeah. let alone all my go tall decks that I run it in. So I just think that that, that will be back breaking in this yes. deck. And finally, I, I know it's six mana and we've recommended a lot of <laughs> cards that uh, have been upping the CMC, but true conviction in a token deck is. You deal with it or you lose. The, the trip because you're just going to lose to the life game. Yeah, that's what it's going to cause. The the trip white is a pain in the butt, but it can be just game changing in the right deck, and this might be the right deck for it. Yep, and you know, just tweaking the mana base just a little doesn't make it that terrible, especially because you're in green and blue where you can back you know your your ramp and card draw up a little more. Yeah. Um, two more I would take a look at here. Um, you know, I know it's a card that people kind of tend to hate, and they may, might hate you for playing it. Aura Shards is just gross. <laughs> it's gross, and it's gross in this deck. There's times you're going to drop Aura Shards, and people are like, you're like, no counterspell, and everyone's like, nope, and you're like, okay, uh, you're going to lose all your stuff. I'm just killing everything because I'm going to make, you know, seven tokens off of this, and you better have an instant speed response, folks, or you're losing every artifact and enchantment in play. That's one I would consider. I, I know it generates some hate, but like it's a it's a nasty card. It's also you know fifteen dollars, so like I get it. We've we've offered a lot of expensive suggestions here, and that's just one more. Um, the last one, Glare of Subduel, and it's an enchantment from the original Ravnica block. Tap an untapped creature you control to tap target artifact or creature. And again, if you're making a ton of tokens. The ability to just lock stuff down, like I've ran into, uh, we used to have a friend in the shop who doesn't play much anymore, but he had a token deck that ran Glare of Subduel, and it is so frustrating, again, in, in a token deck, to get anything done when he can just lock down your creatures that might attack in, or tap down your mana rocks during your um, upkeep when you have to use the mana instant speed or it goes away from your main phase. Um, it's a frustrating, effective card, and in a token, in a Selesnia or Bant token deck, I would be very tempted to run it. There's, yep. there's also Opposition in blue, but I think Opposition um, is a little more expensive, so either of those would do absolute work here. You brought up Aura Shards, made me think of another one. He has a lot of enchantments that uh, are very important to this deck. Yes. Um, Privil Sterling Grove yeah. would be great. It's Two mana. It's pretty expensive. It's like fifteen dollars, yep. but it gives all of your enchantments shroud. So that means all your masks that you're making. Yeah. Um. It just protects everything, and you aren't doing a lot of stuff with your own enchantments, like targeting them or, you know, right. it's not a Voltron deck. Right. The, and the Astrid ability just untaps stuff. It doesn't target anything. So yeah, that that would be fine. In privileged possession, also again, it's I think it's around ten dollars. 
protects all your planeswalkers as well and your enchantments will, will protect everything. So that's one that you could consider there as well. Last but certainly not least in this deck, how about the Planeswalkers, Max? We can't forget those, even Thanks. though even though I almost already did in a bit that our fine editor Ken Petal has edited out. Exactly. It's like Endgame. We needed that second <laughs> right, attempt right, to exactly. make everything yeah. right again. Some time travel will solve any problem. So yeah, there are 13 Planeswalkers, not counting Estrid, so 14 total. We have Ajani, Adversary of Tyrants, uh, his plus one puts a plus one, plus one counter on up to two creatures, target creatures you control. His minus two uh, returns a target creature card with CMC two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. And then his alt is you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step, create three one one white cat tokens with lifelink. So uh, notable, double, uh, you can alt it off a of doubling season. Yes. Ajani Steadfast is three and a white for a four loyalty planeswalker. Uh, plus one up to one target creature gets plus one plus one first strike flying and no first strike vigilance and fly and lifelink uh, minus two says put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control with a, and a, each loyalty counter on uh, each planeswalker each other planeswalker you control and his alt says uh, if a source of damage would deal damage to you are a planeswalker you control prevent all but one of that damage again uh, doubling season altable, but I bet it's that minus two that we're using all the time. Uh, Ajani the Great Hearted out of War of the Spark, four mana, st- five loyalty, static ability of creatures you control have vigilance, plus one says gain three life, and minus two says put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each other planeswalker you control. So, I mean, you get to use that two times before having to worry about uh, needing to plus. Uh, wrapping up the Ajani's, we have Ajani Unyielding, six mana, four loyalty, plus two, reveal the top three cards of your library, put all non-land permanent cards revealed this way into your hand and the rest on the bottom in any order. Minus two says exile target creature, its controller gains life equal to its power, and its ultimate says put five plus one plus one counters on each creature you control and five loyalty counters on each other planeswalker you control. Uh, this, you can't alt right away off a of doubling season. I'm pretty sure this was the intro deck uh, version. Yes, it is. Then yep. we, uh, all three Elspeths are in here, so they're either making tokens, pumping your tokens, and then all their alts, I believe, you can hit off of doubling season. You can, look at that. Uh, we have Garrick Wildspeaker, uh, plus one, untap two target lands, minus one, put a 3-3 beast, and his minus four is an overrun for all your creatures. We have Gideon, the Oath Sworn. I believe this is the intro deck Gideon. Six mana for four loyalty. Static ability of whenever you attack with two or more non-Gideon creatures, put a plus one, plus one counter on each of them. And then his plus two, he becomes a five, five white soldier creature that's still a planeswalker and prevent all damage that would be dealt to him. So he doesn't gain indestructible, which is interesting. Yes. You just get that... Uh, Prevent the damage ability. But buffing your creatures then, on attack is pretty useful. Yes. Uh, minus nine, exile Gideon, the Oath Sworn, and each creature your opponents control. So a uh, kind of calling back to Gideon Champion of Justice from Gate Crash back there, but not destroying everybody's board state. We also have a uh, Hotly Radiant Champion, uh, great in a token deck, four mana, three loyalty. Put a loyalty counter on Hotly for each creature you control. Minus one target creature gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of creatures you control. And the minus eight says you get an emblem with when a creature enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. You may draw a card. May is important there. Uh, we have Kiora the Crashing Wave. Uh, four mana lets you prevent all damage dealt to and dealt by target permanent and opponent controls. Minus one draws a card and lets you play an extra land. And minus five is uh, at the beginning of your end step, you make that 9-9 nine, nine Kraken token. Then we have Narset Transcendent, four mana, six loyalty for a plus one with look at the top three cards of your library. If it's a non-creature, non-land card, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. Plus her minus two is when you cast your next instant or sorcery from your hand, it gains rebound. And minus nine for an emblem with uh, your opponents can't cast non-creature spells. That is backbreaking if that comes out with doubling season. Yeah, it is. And finally, uh, Teferi Temporal Archmage, uh, the mono blue Teferi for six mana, five loyalty. 
Uh, look at the top two cards of your library. Put one on top, one one in your hand, and one on bottom. Minus one, untap up to four target permanents. That seems really good. And then uh, you get an emblem for with you may activate loyalty abilities of planeswalkers you control on any other player's turn as if they were instant spells. And that's ten. Uh, remove ten loyalty counters. Again, doubling season right there. Yeah. Boom. So, so you said you had some suggestions for changes here, Max. I do. Um, so my first two are a couple more Ajani's. Uh, Ajani Strength of the Pride. It's the new one from Core 20 that his minus two makes the Ajani Pride Mate token. Oh, okay. Uh, I like that over Elspeth Tyrael. Uh, Elspeth, you have to do a minus two to make three one ones. Yes. Um, where the I think the cat token is just going to get bigger faster because it gets a plus one, plus one. Every time you gain life, uh, I like the other Johnny, but I also like Elspeth Tyrael. I think the ability to make three is a big deal, particularly when you're looking at all the doublers here. When it could be six, or they could be three angels, or it could be six angels. Um, so I wouldn't pull Elspeth, but I do like the Johnny for sure. The other Johnny I w- would like would be Johnny Mentor of Heroes. Here, um, he was from Journey to Nyx, I believe. Uh, I think so. Yes. Yep, uh, his it's five mana for four a four loyalty planeswalker. Uh, his plus one is distribute three plus one plus one counters among one two or three target creatures you control. That's not a big deal. His other plus one, so it's two plus ones. Uh, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal an aura creature or planeswalker card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Just a way to find those planeswalkers a little faster or some of those utility creatures you need. But his alt is minus eight, gain a hundred life. That's how you get to the end game. Yeah, you just that gets you there. Gain a hundred life. I I would know. I did it at <laughs> Magic Fest Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. A couple other ones I would recommend um, for card draw since this deck is kind of lacking. Uh, Jason Raveler of Secrets. It's his plus one is uh, scry one, then draw a card. Uh, his minus two. Let me just pull it up here. I should know this. It's in a lot of my decks. Minus two says return target creature to its owner's hand. So that's just a good tempo advantage. But his alt uh, for minus eight, you get an emblem with whenever an opponent casts a spell, casts his or her first spell each turn, counter it. Uh, so that's, again, it slows the game down, makes it so you can get to the end game or the mid game to really populate your board with all these tokens. Yep. And then uh, finally, uh, another card draw, and it helps with knowing that back to basics is in this deck. Teferi Hero of Dominaria. Uh, being able to plus one to draw a card, then untap up to two lands. Great. Minus two is another temple hit. His alt for uh, minus eight. You get an emblem with whenever you draw a card, exile, target permanent, your opponent controls. That's break, back, break, back breaking. You can alt it right away off of doubling season. I think that just helps the overall get you to the end game. And finally is Nissa Voice Ascend a card because it lets you make tokens. That's a um, very similar list for the most part to what I had here as well. Yeah, I, I like this. Um, I don't know if there's anything I would change actually from what you just said. Yay! I think you got me here, Max. Woo, four for four tonight, folks. Yeah, you did it. So, Max, I think that covers all the Planeswalker stuff too. You said what I wanted to say. Um, I thought about Garuk Primal Hunter, but I think Trip Green is too much for this deck, and I don't think the upside is quite there. So other than that, you covered the Planeswalker stuff I wanted to add. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I think that's going to cover it for this deck. I like the idea of Estrid Super Friends. That's kind of odd and weird, which is the kind of thing I am a fan of. What do you think of the deck, Max? Um, I I really like it. I like that it's more emphasis on tokens versus the walkers. Yes. Um, and you know what? It's nice not seeing it be uh, the guy from Legends that nobody can afford anymore. Right. Well, and the problem with um, the problem with Super Friends sometimes, too, is there isn't a good win condition. Like, I've seen Super Friends decks where I'm like, how do you ever win this game? You just take long turns and don't ever get anywhere. Focusing on tokens does give you a plan. You have a way to close out a game and win a game. Yeah. So I respect that as well. I appreciate that. And if I'm playing against it, I appreciate actually being able to lose to a good deck versus just sit there and watch you do stuff. 
So thank you very much, Jeff. We appreciate it. We appreciate looking at your deck. And thank you very much for all our Patreons out there who support us and make it possible for us to do this show week in and week out. That is going to wrap it up. Our podcast theme is Retro Future Dirty with Kevin McLeod. Our show was edited by Ken Peddle. You can find him on Twitter at LOAD3R. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. You can find me on Twitter at CMDR Central underscore Max. And of course, you can find Chris at YSquishy1. We will be back with, I think, one more deck tech this week. Is that correct? Um, I am so mixed two up. More. Two more. Okay. All right. So this is, this is the one that airs on Wednesday. That, yes, that one got me too. So Excellent. Yep, two more. All right. Well, we are enjoying Vegas. Hope you enjoy this. We will talk to you later. I'm Dana. And I'm Max. Max.